Well, did you know that as we sit here, there are two different sets of rules for how the universe works? At the, at the largest scale, right? Planets, galaxies, stars, even us, right? Things we can see. Things go by one set of laws of physics called the, called the theory of uh, relativity, you know. But anyway, and the idea is this, is that big bodies, right, that are affected by uh, gravity play by this set of rules. And it's an incredibly predictable set of rules, right? Though, though Newton didn't understand in the late 17th century exactly how gravity worked, he could, with unbelievable mathematical precision predict the motions of stars and moons and planets into the unforeseeable future. In fact, we still use those same equations that Newton came up with to actually land a spaceship on an asteroid millions of miles away. It's a predictable system. But at the smallest scale, atoms and smaller, it's an entirely different set of laws and rules. And it's the exact opposite of what happens at the bigger scale. At the smaller scale, it's completely unpredictable what atoms will do, what subatomic particles will, will do. And the only way that we can be sure about anything is percentages and probabilities. At no point can we say with 100% accuracy that an atom or a subatomic particle will be at a certain place doing a certain thing at a certain time. It's all percentages. Unpredictable. And these two systems, which are both true, don't agree on anything. They're totally inconsistent. And for the smart ones of you out here who may have a, a propensity towards uh, physics and a math, the greatest prizes and the greatest glory await anyone who can unify these two, uh, 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 these two uh, theories into one. The grand unification theory. If you can reconcile these two inconsistent theories, you will be the king or queen of science forever, right? Well, believe it or not, the same sort of inconsistency exists in every world religion. There are two universal truths which are irreconcilable. The first one is God will only accept the perfect ones. The ones who are morally perfect in every possible way. Now this includes not only doing the right things, saying the right things, not doing the, the wrong things and so on, but it also includes doing them for the right reasons. Not doing them for the right reasons i.e. your motivation must be perfect as well as your actions. You must do it out of 100% flawless love of God and 100% flawless love of neighbor. That's the first truth. But here's the second truth. We aren't that. We not only fail to do what we should do, but when we do do the things we should do, we do them for the wrong reasons. We do them, I do them for selfish motivation. 100% selfish? No. But a whole lot more selfishness than I would ever want to admit to anybody. So, here we are, just like physics. Two irreconcilable truths. Is there a solution? Is there a grand unification theory or truth for how we can make these two work with each other? Well, as I said, said earlier, we're in the season of Advent, and this is a time to remember while we look back to his first coming and all the beautiful promises that came out of that, we actually look forward to his second coming when he brings to full completion what he began on earth 2,023 years ago. So to, and so to help our hearts get into the right place so when we come on 
Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to worship our Lord. And we thank him for not only what he's done, but we look forward to what he has promised to uh, finish. Our hearts will be ready, not with fear at our Lord's second coming, but with great joy. So to help us get there, like I said, we're beginning a new sermon series called Hints of Hope. In that, we're looking to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, because in that, the Holy Spirit through Isaiah dropped little hints of hope that pointed towards Jesus, pointed toward the long-awaited Messiah who would bring us out of darkness, who would fulfill all of our hopes and longing and dreams, not the superficial ones, but the deep ones which every human being holds. So this week, what I want to to do is look at the greatest hope I believe that we have in our hearts. And it's how these two truths can be reconciled. How can sinners like me and you be saved by a perfect God? Well, Isaiah points us to it. I want to... I want to bring us right into the heart of this passage. Isaiah 64, starting at verse 4, where he writes this. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you in your ways. Well, what Isaiah is pointing to here is that every human being, every world religion acknowledges this fact, right? He says, from of old, no one has heard. We can't comprehend of a God who acts, who, who does not act for those who wait for him, i.e. put faith in him, trust him, love him, serve him. That's what waiting on him means, right? Not just like sort of a waiting for him to come, but actually serving him like a waitor or a waitress, right? Um, For those who wait for for him, okay, fine. But then here's the part that really hammers us. You, You, God, meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Now, I was reading uh, uh, Tim, Tim Keller by the fire. I tricked you all to pay me to, uh, to uh, do that, just so you know, okay? Um, and I was reading his, his book on Proverbs, and I love this definition of a righteousness where he says, righteousness is dying to yourself so you can make your, your community flourish. And unrighteousness is dying to your community so you can make yourself flourish. Now, that's beautiful. That's a sermon for a different time. But if you're like me, putting yourself as the servant in all things, serving others, especially those who fail you, especially those who do not meet appropriate expectations, especially those who you have failed in the past and you're embarrassed to even be around them, whatever it is, any kind of selfish work, I do not do joyfully in my heart. Honest confession, my family's here. You can ask them. They will tell you this is absolutely true. So already he puts up, Isaiah puts up this universal truth that only the perfect can be in the presence of a holy God. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? It asks. We all have become one like one who is unclean. If you were unclean in the Old Testament, it meant that you had that that you could not come into contact with anything holy. Right. It was a ritual. It wasn't a really a physical uncleanness. It was a ritual one. And that God would despise you and reject you till you'd gone through a certain ritual to sort of get back into his good graces. But even that was a grace of God. All our righteous deeds. Now, these are the good ones. These are the ones where we did it right, right? These are the ones where we feel like we're acting it, and God's so proud of us, and look at us. We, we did this wonderful thing today. Um, God should love me more because of this. And all of our righteous needs are like a polluted garment. This is a polite translation. We have young ears, so I won't give you the full explanation. But let's just say it's the same phrase, a polluted garment is like, you know, dirty diapers, right? It's the most polite way I'll put it. So even the good stuff that we do, we do it from the wrong place. 
There is no one who calls upon your name. No one. Who rouses himself to take hold of you. That word rouses literally means kind of wake up out of your drunken slumber, right? Um, think about the disciples in the Garden of, Geth- of Gethsemane. They, Jesus says, can you just wait up with me until they arrest me? No, they just fall asleep. They can even do, do that, right? For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. This is so honest. Just for me. Just for me. And what's fascinating is every world religion acknowledges this. Islam, even non-theistic religions like Buddhism, even secular humanism, which believes in no God except for the human being, if you will, all say this, God is up here. The, the divine, the perfect, the, what we aspire to be with and be is up here, and all he, human beings are here. We all acknowledge this, right? We all acknowledge this. So if that's true, if these two truths are irreconcilable, then what hope do we have? Isaiah gives us a hint. Look at verses 8 and 9. So after this, you know, you have made us melt in, in the hand of our iniquities, right? Is there any sort of worse place to be than that? Melted, totally unable to uh, do anything. Our sins themselves have destroyed us. But look at these hints. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hands. So what Isaiah is hinting to is something beyond works-based acceptance. In the shocking place, I'm pretty sure this is the only place in the Old Testament where God is referred to as our Father. Now we hear it a lot in the New, of course, because of the Lord's Prayer, but pretty sure this is it. And what he's saying is, is that no... Like a father loves a son or a daughter. Like that relationship, which is based on a reality of who we are in him, not on our performance. We don't stop being a son or a daughter if we're a bad son or daughter. And we don't become more a son or a daughter by by being good. No, there's a deeper hold upon us. And then he takes the analogy one step further. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hands. Now, that gets into all kind of interesting creation theology issues. But the point that Isaiah is trying to make here is a point that we talked about actually in our student ministry life group this this morning. We all talked about um, uh, trusting. What does it mean to trust someone, right? And one of the members of our group uh, said it's, it's like, you know, when you trust someone with a work of art. And the reason why that was such an important thing to this person, anyone who's a, who's a creator understands, is like there's a special bond there. There's a special bond. You love this thing that you have created. You've put hours, if not years, of talent and training and sweat and hard work into creating something beautiful. And when you create that beautiful thing, even if nobody else cares about it, it's beautiful to you because you made it. It's special to you. And Isaiah's reminding the Lord, but, 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 you know, really us, right? Wait a minute. Even though we're sinful and we're flawed, we're still his beautiful creation that he loves so much. So it can't, there has to be something more than us being perfect enough for God to love us. But I think the greatest hint, especially for us in Advent, is in verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. To rend the heavens means to literally tear it apart or tear it into pieces. It's a very specific uh, Hebrew word that's used for this dividing curtain that's between, um, or, or it's sort of hearkening back to this, this dividing curtain be- between the Holy of Holies and the temple where God symbolically lived and the presence of his people. But it's not enough that you rip it away. You have to come down, Lord. Come down. Now, 
Hold on. If you've been listening, then let me ask you this. Isn't it fascinating that at one level, this writer, Isaiah, is saying, Lord, you know, we're sinners. We were to come into your presence. Our sins would melt us in your hands. It'd be awful. But at the same time, he's saying, but we want you to come and be in our presence. That's like committing a crime and calling the police on yourself, right? So what hint of hope is he pointing towards here? Luke 2. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the end. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. What are we visioning? The border between heaven and earth has been ripped apart. Heavenly beings are streaming into this world. Multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. And God himself has come down. In a little baby. Weakness. And and who is he? He's the Savior. Matthew's gospel tells us this when um, the angel appears to, to a Joseph. He says this, And she, Mary, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, which literally means God will save you. He will save you from your sins. In short, Jesus himself is the grand unification theory. Jesus himself is the one who solves the irreconcilable difference between a God that will only accept perfect people and yet we're all sinners. How does he do this? Well, yes, he dies for our sins on the cross. Absolutely. He takes away that stain. He becomes the one that this scripture describes, doesn't he? This isn't a Good Friday sermon, so I'll be quick, right? But he literally becomes the sinner. He takes the punishment. He is melted in God's hands so we don't have to be. He is blown away like like a leaf by our sins. Think about this. We have, you know, this is the one time of this. This week is fall. Please enjoy it, right? And if you go outside, you will find these leaves that just a few months ago were lush and green, and now they crumble in your hands at the slightest pressure. Jesus was crushed for us. God was angry, not at us, but at Jesus on the cross. God took his wrath out on Jesus on the cross. God the Father hid his face from Jesus on the cross. But in doing so, he's turned his face towards us. In doing so, he took us from being dried up leaves to healthy green leaves. But you see, Jesus not only saved us by his death, he saved us by his life. Every single, from the moment Jesus took his first breath in the manger, he began to work our salvation because he lived the perfect life that we could not live. In every moment of Jesus' life, he fulfilled verse 4 and 5. This is a description of Jesus. He is the one God the Father acts for those who wait for him. Jesus perfectly waited for and waited on God and his people. He's the one, Jesus, who joyfully worked righteousness. He didn't, Jesus sort of didn't, you know, drag himself around Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee. And well, if I don't do these things and I'm not going to get to heaven and God will be upset, so I better do these things. 
No, it was his great joy. The number one word to describe Jesus uh, in the New Testament is the word compassion, right? When he went to someone who was sick, when he went to someone who needed healing, when he went to someone who, who needed forgiveness, even his enemies, even those who rejected him, he had compassion for them. He loved them in spite of their sins. So you see, Jesus not only died for us, but one of the ways that he saves us is he took all of these good works and he put them on us like a robe. Or maybe like a... So one of the illustrations I use all the time, sorry if you've heard it again, but it's all I got. Um, When I was in college, we wanted to go to the Coast Guard base to buy a very cheap keg of beer, right? (laughs) It's true. Thank you for laughing. No one who knows me is not shocked. You know, you're not shocked by any of this. Um, and, but how we could get on the base was one of my fraternity brothers. His, his grandfather was an admiral in the U.S. Navy. And he had the little admiral in his grandfather's car for some reason. Had the admiral sticker on his window, right? And we pull up to the, to the Coast Guard base, two 21-year-old college idiots. And they treat us like the admiral. Were we the admiral? No. But we got the benefit of this man who I'd never met. His 35, 40 years of service to our country and, 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 and to his family, the, the enormous amount of sacrifice and hard work, because we got the sticker, we got treated like the admiral. They even put the keg in the back of the car. And that's what Jesus does, you see. That's part of why he's our savior. Because now God can accept us sinners. Yes, because our sins are forgiven, but if we're honest, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's still... We're not sin-free, right? But God, out of his great mercy, on the cross, Jesus says, take all of my hard work and I'm going to put my Admiral sticker on you. I'm going to put my Jesus perfection sticker on you. And now the Father, when he looks at you, he will treat you like me. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? That now, a perfect God can be reconciled and love and welcome us in as his beloved in the same way that he loves Jesus. Let me end with this. There's hope for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you trust in him, I guarantee that there's this part of you which is disgusted with yourself because like me, Because you do love Jesus, you're so grateful for his sacrifice, you're grateful for all the things that I've just said. But when you hear me say all the things I've said, there's a deep guilt inside of you because you know all of this and you're still failing him. You know all of this like me and you're still committing the sins you should not do. You're still doing the things you know you shouldn't do. Not to mention you're doing all the things that you just don't even realize you're doing. Like me, you're tired of hurting God. Like me, you're tired of your selfishness hurting the people that you love. Like me, you're tired of failure upon failure and you think you're going to wear his forgiveness out and you long for the day where you just won't be this person anymore. Well, the hope that we have, the hope that Isaiah points toward is that there will be a day. Yes, you're forgiven right now. You can't lose it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. He's yours. You're his forever. Rest in that truth. But look forward to the day where he has promised you there will be a day when he returns. Where he will take out this heart and this mind and this being and this soul. Who wants to do right but just can't. Who sometimes really wants to to do wrong and just does it anyway. And he'll give us one where it will be impossible for us to sin against God. It will be impossible for us to sin against our neighbor. It will, be, it will only be possible for us to love him with all that we are. It will only be possible for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We'll be the one who joyfully do, right, do righteousness. Don't you long for that day? Well, he's promised it. He's promised it. One more application. The same hope that I've talked about, that's open to everybody. I love St. Thomas's because there are people who don't believe this stuff are always welcome to come in and you'll be loved right where you are and honored and respected. And we invite you into this family. We invite you into this conversation. 
Do you feel like that you're trapped in these two irreconcilable things? I think that many of us do. I think all of us do if we're honest. How could God ever love me when I'm not perfect? I'm well aware of my own faults. But what I want you to hear is it's for you that Jesus came down. It's for you that the whole universe was organized so that God might come in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue us, to forgive us, and to give us hope that even our worst sins will not separate us from him. And if that's your fear, and you've been working hard, you've been following other religions, you've been trying to do all the good works to please God, and you're worn out by it, our Savior says, come, rest in me. I have finished the work, and I will bring you to everlasting life. And that is a hope for us, and that's good news for us sinners indeed. Amen.